few problems are more pervasive in our society than pornography, and few problems are more destructive. Join us today as we explore the truth about our culture's pornography problem with Catholic apologist Matt Frab, author of The Porn Myth, Exposing the Reality Behind the Fantasy of Pornography. I'm Dr. Bob Rice, professor of catechetics at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Rice, a catechetics professor here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we're talking about the porn myth, exposing the reality behind the fantasy of pornography. I'm joined by our regular panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology at the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, Matt Frad. Matt earned his master's and undergraduate degrees in philosophy from Holy Apostles College and is pursuing a master's degree in theology from the Augustine Institute. His podcast, Pints with Aquinas, receives over half a million downloads every month. Matt speaks to tens of thousands of people every year. He is the author of best-selling books such as Does God Exist? A Socratic Dialogue on the Five Ways of Thomas Aquinas, and the book we're talking about today, The Porn Myth, Exposing the Reality Behind the Fantasy of Pornography. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Yeah. You know, just to start off, in regards to your book, you know, as a uh, as some of this work with youth ministry, young adult ministry, um, I've heard a lot of Christian arguments against things like pornography. You know, well, it's against the commandments and other things like that. What fascinated me about your book was your decision to speak of uh, why pornography is bad just from secular reasons. I mean, obviously you shared your faith in the beginning, but mm -hmm. you were just showing it's not you know, bad because God gave a commandment. There's, there, it's intrinsically evil. Right, I think it is intrinsically evil, um, but the reason I wrote a secular book in response to these myths, I would say, about pornography is you know, the same reason we can write a secular book that uh, shows why abortion is evil and why we don't need to appeal to theology to show that to be the case. Uh, so I chose about 40 common myths that I hear from people, <laughs> myths that I used to say and uh, reasons I used to give for why porn might be legitimate and uh, then tried to show with logic and science why it's not true, why pornography is detrimental to the consumer, to our relationships, and to society as a whole. Yeah, I, I really have to commend you uh, for the work that you've done. It's massively researched, uh, oh, and, and the argumentation mm -hmm. is certainly uh, cogent, even unanswerable, but it's a damn depressing book. Yeah, thank uh, you. It sure <laughs> is. I, I shared that with, I mean, only once but before, yeah. only <laughs> once before did I find a topic so intrinsically yeah. uh, unpleasant, and that was uh, homosexuality. But they're both out there. The, the fallout from each yeah. uh, is, is ubiquitous and, and deadly. And it's good if you can marshal even secular arguments to put uh, the, the myth makers uh, to flight. So keep, keep doing it. Sure. You know, you know. I yeah. hope there's not going to be a sequel, though. Well, we'll see. <laughs> well, you know, the idea of applying the social sciences to show how contrary to human nature, how dehumanizing it is. Yeah. I mean, it really, these are the, it isn't like, well, we'll tire right arm behind her back. I mean, these are the best arguments we have. Uh, and the fact that it's rooted in human nature mm -hmm. and not just in revelation, that it's available to reason and not just to faith. I, I really believe that this isn't just for non-Christians, this is to tool up Christians so that we can really engage people, mm -hmm. not only in a more effective strategy, but also in a more substantive presentation. I remember back in the 80s when President Reagan enlisted Attorney General Ed Meese to have this pornography commission. My father-in-law was a major part of this. Yeah. And they made a decision early on. Practically every single member of the commission was a practicing Christian of one denomination or tradition or another. But the, the scientific research was yeah. so overwhelming mm -hmm. yeah. that they just really didn't feel like it would be helpful at all to appeal to faith traditions. And it made it stronger then as well. But I mean, they finished the report, they published it, the government sprang into action, and then along came this thing called the internet. Mm. And by the late yeah. 80s, 
It was just <coughs> washed away in a tsunami of technology. Yeah, over the last 40 years, there's been a lot of research that's come out of academia, like you say, it's from sociology, psychology, neurology, and all of it is saying that porn's not good for us, you yeah. know? And so because of this, we're seeing more and more people speak out against pornography who aren't religious. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, comedian Chris Rock just came out recently and talked about how it led to his divorce, how it messed right. him up. Um, uh, James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica, just narrated an anti-porn documentary, uh, you know, and if yeah. you had told me that when I was a teenager, I would have asked you what drugs you were on, you know, like, yeah. how is that possible? More and more people are beginning to speak out about this. Time Magazine, a couple of years ago, ran an article called Why Those Men Who Grew Up With Internet Porn Are Now The Advocates For Turning It Off. Yeah. And a lot of these people aren't religious. Uh, my friend um, Alexander Rhodes runs a website called nofap.com. There's a subreddit group that has around 400,000 members, many of whom aren't religious. They've just seen porn's detrimental effects in their life. So I guess you could say that science uh, is finally catching up with the truth the church is always Yeah, yeah. yeah because faith and reason, they, they stand or fall together. And it is reassuring to know that it not only damages the soul, because it does, it imperils yes. the prospect of, of eternal life. Yes. But the damage it does to the brain, mm -hmm. I, I think most people don't consider that as, as part of uh, the fallout. Could you maybe talk about that? Yeah. Right, yeah. So right now there's about 40 neuroscience-based studies on porn users, and all of them support the addiction model. Now, when you say addiction, people get uh, maybe a little, they wonder whether we should use that word or not. They yeah. say, well, aren't people just sort of, you know, using the word addiction to evade culpability? Yeah. Uh, can't, can't that word just be abused? You know, you, you meet oh. people, you say, you're not really addicted. You're just saying addicted because you have a problem with it. What do we mean right. by addiction? Yeah. Well, just like you would expect to see and do see brain changes uh, from the person who's addicted to, say, alcohol or nicotine or methamphetamines, what I'm saying when I say the addiction model is I'm saying we're seeing the same thing in people who use pornography. So there was a study that came out from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, sort of like the Harvard of Germany. Yeah. The lead researcher's name was Simon Kuhn. And they found that there was a correlation between hours spent viewing porn and shrinkage in the brain. Their hypothesis was that this was a matter of causation, not just correlation. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it's having this negative impact on the brain. I mean, one of the things, the neurotransmitter which incentivizes us to perform actions that are conducive to our survival is dopamine. And what neuroscientists are discovering is if you engage in pornography with any regularity, that the dopamine system begins to fatigue. So dopamine begins to sh like sh atrophy. And then the reward center in the brain called the nucleus accumbens is in a state of dopamine craving. And so it's for this reason that people who view pornography have to either watch more of it than they yeah. used to or more deviant forms of it just to get the same increase in dopamine, to get the right. same rush yeah. that they did in the beginning. My heavens. And of yeah. course, if you start messing with the brain, all sorts right. of things happen. Right. You start struggling with anxiety, erectile right. dysfunction, all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is pro-brain, I think. Yeah. Right? Well, Even if they yeah. don't believe in the soul, they believe that there's something under the hood yeah. that they'd like to respect and keep healthy. And that's but, what's happening. So, I mean, this is an, there's, this, there's this big epidemic now of erectile dysfunction in young men and sexual dysfunction. In young men? The very young men, yeah. yeah. So um, my, I, ha I run a podcast called Love People Use Things. I, I co-host it with an atheist. Him and I disagree about a lot of things, obviously, but we both agree that our life would be more beautiful without pornography. But the reason my co-host Noah Noah Church, a very ironic name for an atheist. <laughs> the reason he quit porn is because, you know, not, not believing in chastity or saving sexual marriage, he tried to engage in a relationship uh, and he couldn't. Freaked out, went online and found literally tens of thousands of other young men where this was happening. Oh, yeah. And it was for that reason that he, he decided to quit porn and then found out. Yeah. And why doesn't the porn industry tell us this? Uh, <laughs> I wonder. Well, I mean, you I just pointed to the same reason the tobacco industry doesn't right, advertise right, the, Yeah. I mean, there are two mountain peaks that stand in the way of us getting to the promised land of liberation from this vice. Uh, one is the porn industry. It's simply too lucrative. Right. And so the, 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 it's not an argument from economics, it's just the economic fact mm -hmm. that right. people are making too much money. Mm -hmm. The other 
side of this, the Twin Peak, is politics. The notion of freedom has yeah. been so counterfeited successfully yeah, yeah. that freedom is defined in negative terms that we're free yes, from, from all of these laws mm -hmm. that constrict us, you know. And in fact, the traditional understanding of freedom has got to be reclaimed as you are doing it, and that is freedom for. It's, yeah. a, it's a freedom for excellence, to excel right. in every human endeavor. And so virtue is sort of what you know, yes. what, what muscles are to the body, virtues are to the soul. Very. And you don't even need theology to get that yep. back again, but you do need to address the economic and the political mm -hmm. obstacles yeah. because, yeah. I mean, these seem to me to be somewhat insurmountable given yeah. our cultural climate. You well, know, when you, you take you, a look at the idea of censorship, you know, yeah, which everybody right. gets very upset about. Matt, how did you in your book talk about what is pornography? Because that's often yeah. how the argument comes in. They're like, well, if you censor pornography, You've got yeah, to censor I think it was, everything. I think and it was so, uh, U.S. Justice uh, Potter, Stewart. Potter Stewart who yeah, said uh, yeah. famously, uh, he was reviewing a, a French film, I think called The Lovers. He said, I know it when I see it, and right, this isn't yeah. pornography. Yeah. Uh, not that helpful. Uh, <laughs> right, right. So, uh, you know, it's difficult to define pornography. Yeah. It's difficult to define a lot of things, like art. Try and define art. And, you know. yeah. Well, I, I would say maybe this might be the beginning of a definition. You might say that pornography, it comes from two Greek words, which mean like the writing or drawing of the prostitutes. That's etymologically what it might mean. Yeah. But I think a helpful definition might be uh, that pornography is sexually explicit material which is intended to sexually arouse or by and large has that effect. Right. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, I, I'm sure that's not great. Well, that's the best I've kind of come up with. But in your with. book, uh, I, I think you have a number of working uh, hypotheses. Yeah. Uh, for example, it's, it's something that, that the industry harnesses so that men can masturbate in front of images of women right. who it's, have been it's, reduced it's meant to, to an object. It's meant to replace a prostitute. Right. It, and it I was the same function I was really struck by the one line uh, in your book that more porn doesn't get you better sex. In fact, it doesn't get you any sex. Right. It just gets you more porn. Yeah. Sort of like alcohol, you want more. You want more fun and, and this from is, life. This is this is the myth. I think sometimes wives might believe, and of course, pornography is something consumed by both men and women. Yeah. But sometimes you'll hear the myth. You know, you say, "Well, maybe your husband wouldn't look at porn if, if right. he would have sex more." But thinking that you can cure a porn addict by giving him more sex is like thinking you can cure a gambling addict by giving him money. <laughs> Right. It's not yeah. what he's after, really. Right. You right. know, it's a lot more complicated yeah. than that. Well, what also complicates the issue, uh, if we think of it as an addiction, uh, for example, uh, alcohol is yeah. an addiction, but you've got to pay for it. And right. it can be bloody expensive to keep that habit going, especially if you like good wine. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a porn addiction, it's free. Yeah. You just turn on the internet. It's everywhere. Uh, so. I think we come back to the argument about freedom of expression. Does it really extend to something that's poison, that's so toxic? Well, pornography isn't covered by free speech. That's right. Like slander yeah. isn't covered by yeah. free speech. You yeah. know, you can slander me and I can sue you, you know. Right. But the problem is that the laws aren't being enforced. Yeah. Uh, one great group uh, that's doing a lot of work in this area is the National Center on Sexual Exploitation up in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are in large part why, why several states like Utah and others have declared pornography a public health crisis. Um, they are the reason why Hilton and other big hotel chains have decided to remove pornography from their hotels. They were instrumental in getting Google to remove pornographic ads and pornography, pornographic apps from their app store. So I don't know much about the legal side yeah, of this issue, yeah. but NICOSI, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, does, and they're doing a lot of good work. You know, what seems to me to be the key is this core element that pornography has absolutely no relationship to another person. Yeah. Right. You know, there's a complete relational void. Yeah. Uh, and so when you bring up the fact that, you know, it might enhance your sexuality within marriage, which is a complete, Myth, yeah. yeah, it's the opposite of the truth. But I, I think it, it, it sort of implies what really is the common denominator in all pornography, soft, hard, deviant, what have you, and that is there is no other person. Yeah. Right. There is no real relationship. Yeah. Yeah. There, in fact, isn't physical contact. Yeah. Mm. And, and so it reduces your capacity until it finally paralyzes yeah. the soul in fact, from actual 
physical and interpersonal yeah. intimacy. The other person gets in the way. He yeah. or she Indeed. is an impediment. That, that is the irony. For right. all of its yeah. claims of exposure, right. pornography ends up obfuscating and suppressing yeah. the personhood yeah. of the performer. Right. Sex right. becomes one-dimensional right. and boring. And it's solipsistic. It goes nowhere. Solipsistic is indeed the, that's a yeah. good word for it. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a great philosopher, Ortega y Gasset, who defined barbarism as the tendency to dissociate. Mm. When you separate and divide right. people, when you break the bond of eros, which is interest in the other, yeah. um, and you rip sex out of that relational context, that's barbaric. Yeah. And that's how we're treating one that another. Now, one thing that I've been thinking about lately is, while I'm happy that I wrote a book that's a non-religious response to pro-porn arguments, uh, the more I think about it, the, the more um, I, I'm inclined to make more sort of religious or philosophically, kind yeah. of religiously bent arguments. Yeah. Uh, because what is the human person? Uh, Wojtyla in Love and Responsibility says, the human person is a good towards which the only proper and adequate attitude is love. Right. What's your yeah. sort of ontological basis for making such a claim? Now, yeah. if it's true, then we should say, well, what's love and what's pornography? And uh, it seems to me that when one consumes pornography, one uses, merely uses, subordinates right. the good of the other to the good of pleasure in a way that does violence to the other. That's exactly and I don't right. know if yeah. you can make that kind of claim uh, without invoking the moral law or you, God. You can make it, but you can't sustain person. it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, well, when we come back, we will talk a lot more about this. So please stay with us. The most important program that I found helpful in my recovery from pornography addiction was a program called Fortify. It's run through fightthenewdrug.com. It's an amazing program that especially helped me realize the scientific aspects that pornography has on one's mind. Most notably that um, the brain is plastic, a concept called neuroplasticity, and that it is moldable. So that is to say, the more you engage your passions, the more I engaged what I love, um, taking a walk, praying, um, the more I engage that and uh, turned less and less to pornography, um, the more it made me um, happy and the more it made me realize that um, I don't need this in my life anymore. When God created you, he made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ in this church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about the porn myth with our guest, Catholic apologist, Matt Frab. Matt, you do a lot of speaking around the country, and your book has, what, 40 myths that about you that, look yeah. into? So obviously when you speak, you don't talk about all 40. What are some of the, what are yeah. the, some of the key myths mm. you know, that are out well, there that you, know, you what, think are good to speak on? One of the nice things about attacking this issue from the myths perspective is that you get to try and attack porn from every angle available. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of like the way, um, anti-tobacco groups. Now, I'm not comparing the morality of tobacco pornography, of course, but, you know, it's like, well, it'll kill you. You're like, oh, I don't care. It'll kill your kids. Well, <laughs> I, I remember my, my mum put a sticker on my dad's toolbox. So I always remember as a kid, it said, kiss a non-smoker, enjoy the difference. Uh -huh. And it's, it's always like, well, if I, if I can't convince you right. this way, we'll try this way. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the reasons I, I like kind of discussing it from these different vantage points, because not all will appeal to everybody, but maybe right. one will. Yeah. So I, I don't know, myths like uh, that pornography is adult entertainment, right. you know, right. or that um, it's not addictive, 
or that those in the industry are just sort of well-rounded nymphomaniacs who find their work liberating, right. uh, or that I can never be free of this might be another myth, uh, or that if I watch certain kinds of pornography, like right. cartoon, anime sort of pornography, yeah. well, that's not bad since there's no live actors, or uh, maybe yeah. masturbation without pornography is good. You know, I just, right, right. you know, and, and I'm sure there have been students who maybe heard some of the myths that I presented and went, nah, I don't think there's got anything there. But maybe when I start talking about the fact that if you consume pornography with any regularity, it'll make you sexually dissatisfied. Right. Like if you, like Jason Everett puts it this way, if you want to shoot your future marriage in the head, <laughs> pornography is the way to go. Right. Like yeah. I couldn't suggest a better way to do it. Yeah. Um, and so. One of the things that really struck me in the book, and you know, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of young men, you know, in my travels about pornography, but what you wrote about the seediness, you know, th this idea that, well, everybody's, you know, doing this because they're artists and they love it and they're <laughs> expressing themselves and these women want it and mm. want you to have this and these men want you. And then you really took a look at the life of many of the people who are being victimized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really changes your perspective, I think. And I, I find this always a, a very strong argument for men who are faithful when it's like you're, you're you're not just watching a play, you're you're actually watching somebody who are, is often being abused in front of your very eye, mm -hmm. um, and and I find that to be a, a very eye-opening myth breaker, you know, in, in your particular. Well, work. you know that that yep. raises a, a distinction which I think is worth making. Uh, what makes pornography, I, I think, so evil is not just the depiction of of a nude body parts right. sort of assembled artfully mm. uh, uh, before a camera. No, it's not that. It's the degradation that's right. that implies. Here's a whole human being that's being stripped Reduced of... Reduced to an animate provider right, of pleasure. Yeah, stripped of yeah. her or his dignity. Mm. Uh, the imperishable importance of this other uh, has been uh, uh, sort of uh, stripped away, uh, debased. Uh, and denuded of, of the mystery. And, and, that, and to witness that and to take pleasure from that, to find it fascinating, that really is a tribute to uh, the depravity of, uh, of this market. Yeah, I, I remember hearing an alcoholic who said he was only able to be free of alcohol or to begin to be free when he admitted he loved getting drunk, yeah. but that it was killing him. And I think something similar needs to take place for people who want to be free of porn. Like pornography is pleasurable. Like masturbation feels good. Yeah. Uh, and to and to pretend that it doesn't doesn't serve you any good. You know, it's like it does feel good. Yeah. Right. Pornography does right. make you feel uh, powerful and excited and all those things. But it's killing you. Right. Uh, so I think it's in it's important to kind of admit a, uh, the worm on the hook if you want. Yeah. You know, that there's a reason we're attracted the, uh, to it. The, the destruction of the person by reducing her to an object, him or her. I, I think we have to also reflect upon how reciprocal that is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's dehumanizing for both the consumer That's as right. well. Yeah. And, I, you know, and, and clearly there's victimization, but it really is mutual. It's a mutual you know, degradation. It's a, yep. it's a seduction, but it's also an absolute reduction. You act like a predator and I'll act like the prey. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about the way you deal with 24 specific myths is the how you divide them up. Mm. Because in the beginning, you're dealing with culture. Then you move into industry. And so it's like a wide gate for everybody to enter because the culture is so, you know, it's so apparent and it's so ubiquitous, you can't get away from it. But when you look into the industry, you realize these poor souls, yeah. and not just the women, especially them, but the cameramen, the producers, the marketers, right. the consumers, it's, this, it's, it's destruction, but it's also massive deception. And just because it's mutual yeah. and free, it doesn't, it doesn't... In some ways, it makes it worse. In some ways. You That's have to right. understand that with some nuance or else it could sound however it sounds. But you know, if two people agree to degrading each other, does that make it better? Right. Um, yeah, right. Right. It seems to me that it's a manly thing to treat a woman who has forgotten her dignity with dignity nonetheless. Right, uh, especially. You know, not yeah. to but, capitalize but on that. I wanted to capitalize on this because you move then into our sexuality and then our relationships in parts three and four. So from culture to industry to who we are as right. persons mm -hmm. yeah. and what it means to be in relationship. Yeah. And by the time you're done with the struggle with porn, I think you've set people up for the gospel. You know, Because while there are people who can do it just by picking themselves up by their own bootstraps through mm -hmm. effort, Herculean, heroic effort, the fact is most people can't. 
they need Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's not like an accident, it's not something alien or extrinsic you know, to the message. I really believe that this sort of message has to get out. These sorts of arguments have to be made. But once they're made, they're going to prove to be as powerful a form of pre-evangelization yeah. as we have ever had. And, and why yeah, shouldn't yeah, that be the case? A, because in other areas, other addictions, like the 12-step program exactly. to rid yourself of, of alcohol or drug yeah. uh, dependency, you have to begin by acknowledging, A, I'm powerless, I've got this problem, I can't solve it, and B, I need to appeal to a higher power. That's right. I love what you said there. It, it is a kind of, a, it leads to the evangelization because even in like AA groups or SA groups, for Sexaholics Anonymous, what is it that you're doing? Well, you're sitting with people and being honest with them and having right. them yeah. care about you. That's yeah. not something that should stop once you gain some amount of sobriety. Right, it's really right. human formation that we're it talking is. about. Like, how really do, I, how yeah. do I do friendships? And, yeah. Yeah. and what do I do when I feel emotionally turbulent? Do I turn to that thing that gives me a quick fix? Uh, or do I learn how to, say, uh, forego the immediate pleasure for a, for a greater good? And right. we're becoming kind of better humans. Right. I, I do feel, though, in the church, perhaps because we haven't understood how pornography does affect the brain, yeah. we've over-spiritualized right. this issue. Right. So you'll hear things like we get to pray the rosary more and wear this colored scapular right. and read this book. And right. all of those things are, I'm sure, helpful. Um, but it, I like to analogize it to this. If you met someone exhibiting signs of clinical depression, yeah. you would say more than right. pray. Yeah. Uh, yeah, doing Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, so it's a choice, you know. Right. You, you would say, are you seeing someone? Yeah, uh, you right. would admit your incompetence. You would yeah. say, well, I, I'm not sure, but maybe you should be taking medication. You see, you know, and I think we have to be doing something similar to that because right. we have to face the fact, I know atheists who don't look at porn anymore. You know, and so what, how do you, what do you do with that? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that prayer and the sacraments aren't efficacious, they are. But it's, it's got to be a kind of combination of, of, of different things because this isn't a solely spiritual issue. Right, right. And it's, right. It, it seems but, to, but religion yeah. is not merely a supernatural thing That's either. Right. It's yeah. also natural and human. Yep. So when you look at the virtues that really are our moral muscles for the soul, justice is the highest. But the highest form of justice is religion for Cicero, not just mm. for Aquinas. And Aquinas cites Cicero because it is the virtue of virtue, religion, paying back to God. It is right and just to give him thanks and praise. It is wrong and unjust. And so if we're going to have a well-rounded soul, and all of the muscles are going to be coordinated, that element of prayer is not something that is reducible to scapulars and rosaries, right. as, as beautiful as those things are. Yep. And so even if we do have atheists who are in happy marriages or who do not do pornography anymore, the fact is the common lot is this. In seventh and eighth grade, I had, in fact, when I was reading your book, I was reminded of this. In seventh and eighth grade, I had so many good friends, good guys. They were athletes, they were musicians, and then one by one, we all got drawn into porn. It wasn't until about the end of eighth grade where I was really, really we're not doing sports, we're, we're, we're doing bad music, you know, and we're doing crime and we're getting caught because we're too burned out to, and, and that was my awakening, you know, that was the opportunity that I had. And then I watched these friends of mine just waste away. Yeah. And they were more talented, more intelligent, more athletic than I was, you know, but it really was the gospel for me. And it wasn't just something like pie at the end, dessert that comes, you know. Mm -hmm. It really was the main course because suddenly I think this is the way that most people become truly and fully human through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, I don't want to make it seem as though we have to begin there, but I do think that more than nine out of 10 people have to end there. Do you think yeah. it's a kind of dualism then to kind of focus solely on the supernatural aspects, say, the, you know, what we say, the rosaries, the scapulas, without kind of incorporating the virtues? Is well, that you what know, you your, your uh, podcast, Pints with Aquinas, yep. you know, shows that nature and right. grace, one hand washes the other, yeah. Yeah. the natural and the supernatural, the human and the divine. But to be human is to be oriented to the divine because to do violence to the person through pornography is to do violence to that which God himself yeah. right. has created out of nothing. Yep. Personhood is more than egg and sperm uniting. Right. Personhood is exactly what God creates us to be out of nothing. And yeah. so to ignore that relationship isn't just bad theology, 
It's bad psychology, yeah. Yeah. bad sociology. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Matt, you send up a, a lot of clay pigeons into <laughs> the sky and you shoot them all down. And some of them are perfectly natural and secular, but there's always that openness to grace, to That's more, that right. ideal integration. For example, the appeal to vanity or self-interest. You know, it's not very sexy to do porn. Uh, your wife is not going to find that uh, right. exhilarating. Yeah. So cut it out. But at the end of the day, you have to appeal to more than you simply do. your wife or yeah. your own uh, unified pleasure. You have to appeal to Indeed. God. And this is what I'm seeing in my friends who are self-declared atheists and agnostics. They stopped looking at porn because they lost their sexual function. Yeah. Then they started to kind of empathize all of a sudden with those in pornography and think, should we really treat people like that? Right. And all of a sudden, you're dangerously close to the moral argument for God's existence. <laughs> right. you know? You're backing yourself right. yeah. into God's yeah. arms. Yeah. 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 So how might we help people who are struggling with pornography? Obviously, the stats that you show is a huge amount of people, particularly young people. You know, you talked about one of the myths is a feeling of, I can never be freed from this. And I think we've been talking about some of these ways to do it. As, as you, I'm sure, talk to many young men and women who are addicted to yep. this, what are some of the pieces Gosh. of advice you give? How much time do we have? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we do have another segment we can roll into. Right. right. Well, I think the first thing that has to happen for any of us is we have to just admit that I have a problem and I need to change. Like, I don't want to be this sort of person anymore. And, and I've got to get serious about it. I can't tell you how many, well, people I've chatted with who just complain about what they have to do. You know, you'll tell them, well, you have to get good filtering, like Covenant Eyes. And they say, well, won't that slow down my computer? And, and you think, just, well, shut up then. Just look at pornography then and see how wide the gates of hell are. Yeah. You know, you have, to, you have to kind of shake people into sanity and realize this isn't a game. This is cancerous and it's killing you and mm. your most cherished relationships and it'll kill your soul. Wake up. And I think once one per someone's awake like that, you, you then can talk about, okay, accountability software, finding a good accountability partner. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, the three A's of the internet, accessibility, anonymity, and affordability. They need to be reversed, okay? So yeah. porn has to cost you something, and it can yeah. no longer be anonymous. And you have to, you know, you have to uh, uh, make it so that it's not as accessible. After those sort of initial things take place, I, I would suggest counseling with a certified sex addiction therapist. I'm a big fan of Sexaholics Anonymous, SA.org, yeah. and finding a good spiritual director that can help you kind of um, re rehabilitate the God image. You know, it, it might be the case that, that you've begun to believe things about yourself and God and your relationship with Him that need to be healed. Mm. Uh, so I think those are some three big gun ish, big yeah. gun things that that, that can that can help. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic, and we'll be talking uh, more about this with Matt Frad uh, at Franciscan University presents. Stay with us. One of the things I have a privilege of here at Franciscan is being able to be a part of a men's purity group. And one of the things that it's taught me is that, um, that this goes beyond just the pornography being the problem, um, but that the fact that it's the only way that I'm medicating um, the problem that I have. And it's really taught me to go out of myself and really look at the fact that this is not something I can just white knuckle or get over. The thing is I have to look into the relationships, the self, my self-image, my relationship skills with others, um, the way that you know I need or want intimacy and how do I find that and the ways I search for that. And so it's helped me go out and look and how I can find healthy ways of responding to those things. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, you'll be prepared for real world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we're coming to you from the Communication Arts Studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment and my colleagues in the theology department, Dr. Regis Martin and Dr. Scott Hahn, are guiding our discussion of Matt Frad's book, The Porn Myth, Exposing the Reality Behind the Fantasy of Pornography. In the last segment, Scott, I appreciated your witness of uh, how you, you know, some of the experiences you had when you were younger. 
Matt, you share a bit of this in your book. I mean, what caused you to write a book yeah. like this? I was eight years old when I first saw pornography in a, in a relative shed. Uh, that uh, led me to then steal pornography from newspaper stores and that sort of thing. And it wasn't until and the internet came in. I was about 15. Uh, and it was just good night, you know. I was looking at porn every day at that point. When I was 17 uh, is when I accepted Christ and became a Christian from being a pretty staunch agnostic, if you can be a staunch agnostic. And um, at that point, I started to get serious about trying to not look at it. I was embarrassed about it. Uh, I, I liked watching it. It felt good. But at the same time, I knew I shouldn't be. And it kind of made me feel gross. I didn't really know what to do. Mm. And... Um, uh, yeah, and so gradually over the years, finding accountability, deciding what kind of person I want to be, falling back into it, uh, coming back out of it, uh, all, all those sorts of things. I, I like to say that freedom from pornography is less of a destination one reaches and, and more of a daily choice that one makes mm. by one's actions, you know. Yeah. It's easy to get emotional after a sexual setback and say, I'll never do that again. Yeah. Uh, but it lacks the concreteness of a good resolution. Right. Well, it's sort of like the, uh, the effort to become a saint. Yeah. It's not something you do in a weekend. Yeah. It's not like life in <laughs> right. the spirit. Suddenly I'm, I'm having visions yeah. of the Blessed especially Mother. If you've it's been a process. An, especially if this struggle. has been an influence in your life. Like when I was 12, I had a friend's mum buy us porn oh, on yeah. sleepovers. You know, she would buy us hard liquor. So I'm 12 year old drinking wow. vodka, watching porn. This was my teenage years, you know? She has a lot to answer for. She does. Yeah. She does. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you point out something that I think is important just for ordinary Catholic Christians, especially men, but also women, because even though we haven't addressed it, it also now afflicts women just as much or getting there. Yeah. And, and that is this idea that if you do overcome it and you achieve a certain degree of moral momentum, you have experience of integrity. You, mm -hmm. you have that sense that with purity comes power, yeah. but you never detach so much from your sexuality that you're not vulnerable. Right. I mean, it's one right. of those things where as soon as you think you stand, as St. Paul tells the Corinthians, right. take heed lest right. you fall. And that fall, Aquinas points out, that a fall into the sin of the flesh is usually an indication that you've backed yourself into pride. Mm. And so it isn't as though sins of the flesh are worse than sins of pride. In fact, sins of intellectual pride are the most serious of all. That's, that's Satan's sin. He doesn't yeah. watch pornography. Right. But the idea that we are still weak and still vulnerable, I think, is one of life's most valuable lessons yeah. for us to recognize right. the fact that we're not saints. Mm -hmm. You know, when people come up and say this, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you're, you're a saint only when you've experienced the hour of death and you've offered your life like Jesus did, you know. Mm. And up until that point, we have many opportunities to do it. But I, I really think that you can achieve a certain degree of more momentum as yeah. long as you achieve that point. other virtue of, of humility. Mm. You know I am always at risk. And, and I like to liken it to, say, a sporting injury. I don't know because I never played sports as a kid. I was terrible. But, you know, you can imagine if you, if you dislocated something or broke something, even if it got to a point where you felt pretty good, it's something you're still cognizant right. of, especially right. if you're yeah. playing sport. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with me and other people who've looked at pornography in the past. It's like, okay, um, you know, like having a drink or two and then binging on Netflix, probably a bad idea mm -hmm. uh, because this might end up in a bad place. And so having self-knowledge. Right. Yeah. right. You know, yeah, I mean, the wound of concupiscence is always with us. We never uproot that. Yeah. The desire, the propensity, uh, the misuse of reason, it's always there, always a temptation. That's why Pelagianism is really so poisonous yeah. because it, it, it tells us that you can somehow effect virtue uh, under your own steam. Just mm -hmm. say no like Nancy Reagan uh, urges. Yeah. That's not enough. And imitating not, Jesus is not enough. You need Jesus. Right. You don't need his example. You need his person. Mm. Uh, and that's a religious conversion. And sooner or later, you've got to embrace it, either now or in purgatory. Mm. But it's going to happen. You've got to face God. Concupiscence is one of those terms that I think has to be sort of unpacked. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's a darkened intellect. It's a weakened will. They're disordered passions, affections, and appetites. And I think what we have to recognize then is 
that you know we are weak, we are vulnerable, yeah. but we also have an opportunity to engage in spiritual warfare mm. and achieve merit and that sort of Indeed. thing. But as the day gets older and as we get closer to night, as spiritual direction, you know, it's not enough to go to confession. You already mentioned spiritual direction. I want to underscore that importance. Mm. Because my spiritual director says, when night falls, your smartphone becomes a dumb phone. Mm. Mm. And when you don't need it, turn it off. Yeah. You know, and remove every other occasion of sin and temptation. You know, otherwise you're setting yourself like a bowling pin. You know? Or when night falls, I become a dumb person. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. That's I'm right. the idiot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what he was implying, yeah. trying to communicate some modern perspective. Yeah. Exactly, uh, yeah. Matt. How has your perspective now on this changed, being a father? I mean, you have four mm. kids. And, um, well, uh, you know, I think one of the questions I think we could all do to ask ourselves is what kind of person do I want to be? What kind of, what kind of men do I respect? H how do I want to be remembered, you know? Do I want to be the sort of man who creeps off with his phone late at night to have an intimate encounter with uh, my iPhone? Uh, probably not, you know. I, I had a young woman who was addicted to porn say to me, I don't want to be a mum one day, you know, who has to keep clearing her history files diligently mm -hmm. lest her child find out mum's a porn addict, you know. I think that those are good questions, you know. Who do, who do I want to be and what changes in my life do I need to make now so that I can become the sort of person I want to be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think having children helps in that sense that I, I look at myself through their eyes and I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be somebody who writes books on pornography but looks at pornography. Right. Uh, right. Right. I don't want to be someone who tries to call others to sanctity but really I don't fast much, I don't really pray much. Yeah. I mean I'm guilty of that but I don't want that. Like I really actually want to be holy and I think yeah. having kids helps helps in that sense. Obviously I'm concerned with my children as anyone who has children ought to be concerned. Uh, we're raising them in a kind of pornified society and so we have to parent accordingly. Uh, we can't parent the same way our parents parented. Yeah, and talk, yeah. talk more about that because yeah. I imagine yeah. there might be many viewers who yeah. might not have had the struggle of pornography, but certainly their children or grandchildren. Yeah, uh, this is something that they're really caught up in, and an older generation uh, might, you know, they're parenting the way their parents parented them, and yet there's a very different world out there. Well, I'm just going to say it. I'll say it. it'll be it'll it'll come across a little uh, jarring, perhaps, but I'll I'll then backtrack a little. I think that parents have to talk to children about pornography. Yeah. Now, when you say that, people immediately think, I don't want to scandalize my child, which is a good thing to not want to do. But uh, I think there's a way to talk to our children about pornography in a way that doesn't scandalize them. And we have to do it because, you know, if your kid's six, say, the chances are he has access to an iPhone or tablet, which accesses porn, either at your house, a, p a friend's house, at mm -hmm. school. So if we can talk to our children about other issues, say like abduction, you know, we, we all right. said to our kid, you know, you mustn't do that, don't run away. Someone could take you away from us. If we can do that, we could also talk about pornography in an age appropriate way. And so I advise parents to say something like this, you know, that maybe from the age of six, they'll say, uh, pornography is pictures or videos uh, of people who are showing parts of their body that their bathing suit should cover. You know, yeah. and you'll say, if you ever mm. see that or if someone ever shows that to you, you should always tell mummy or daddy, and yeah. we'd be really proud of you for doing that. Yeah. You might think you'd be in trouble, but you wouldn't be. Yeah. Well, We'd actually beautiful. be really proud right. of you. And, and the other side of the coin is to have the conversation about sex. I mean, you right. quote Frank Sheet in the book who says, yeah. look, we hardly ever think about sex. That's right. We fantasize, we mm. dream, we invent, we mythologize. But the truth about sex, what is it for? Yeah. You know, bonding and procreation. Right. We hardly ever speak of that. And we often use the, the word sex talk as if yeah. one talk was sufficient. Right. Well, we don't have the math talk. Right. You know, there, there's <laughs> a, there's a, we have classes, you know. Yeah. And, and so I think, yeah, you know, from a young age being being able to talk to our children about their bodies. Like one of the things I did recently was remind my daughter why her belly was more special than mine. Yeah. You know, she has this thing called a womb, which is actually really cool. You know? right, right, and that yeah. this is why we veil what demands the reverence. Yeah. It's not and, and walking the talk is important because children see how their parents behave, yeah. the interaction between husband and right, wife. Right, and showing a, it's a got to positive be affection by between love, husband and respect, wife. And, you know, tenderness. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you view your wife as an object, mm. then of course they're going to grow up with that mindset. Mm. I've I got to rewind the tape, sure. not literally, but yeah. um, you just shared something about three minutes ago. I mean, everything you've said, 
gold, maybe silver, but this was diamonds. I mean, to the six-year-old. Yeah. I went through the book. I didn't read everything closely, sure. but I don't remember that. Is that yeah, in there? Yeah, it is in there. Yeah, okay. Towards the end, it's like, how are we going to protect our children from this? We were at a store recently, and my son was looking at this Sports Illustrated rack, you know, and he uh -huh. said, Dad, is that pornography? And I recommend parents use the word pornography. It's important right. that we name it. And uh, I said, well, yeah, it is. It's pretty sad that this woman doesn't know her dignity. You know, one of the corporal works of mercy, you'll remember, Liam, is to clothe the naked. And so we just spent the next minute turning <laughs> around all the magazines while people looked on at us, you know, but no one's ever stopped me. Uh, but but I, I think it's important. And if you find your kid looking at porn, I, I, I say, okay, you take them, you sit them down, you know, when the other kids are in bed and you apologize to them because it's your fault as a parent if your kids see porn. Or at the very least, it's not your kid's fault. I mean, to think that I can give birth and raise my kids in a pornified culture, give them a portable X-rated movie theater, which also makes phone calls, and then somehow be shocked and clutch my pearls when I discover that they're interested in sex, that's right. not their fault. Right, right, right. right. It, it, yeah. it would be weird if they weren't interested in sex. Right. So when that happens to me, my kids are still young, I'll say, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. It shouldn't have. Yeah. But I want you to know that mummy and daddy are going to make some changes in this house so that, so that we're protected, you know, so that we're protected, you know. Please tell us when this happens. Because I, I had friends who came home from school only to find their porn torn in shreds by their parents who found it which is an understandable reaction. But do you think these children ever went to their mum or dad and went, I can't stop looking, please help me? I just heard of a 12 year old boy who broke his phone three times because he couldn't stop looking at porn. You know, the first time he smashed it, tried to hide it from his parents and they said, well, what happened? He said, I dropped it. But he was looking at porn, he didn't want right. to. By the third time they said, okay, what is going on? And he said, yeah. I can't stop looking. Yeah. And I think it's so yeah. unfair to our children that we would give them these electronic yeah. devices without locking them down, get angry with them when we find right. out that they're looking at it, and then put the burden on their shoulders as right. if they should right. be the ones coming to us rather right. than us initiating the conversation. Right. Yeah. See, what you just said really hits me as a parent mm. in a deep way because you know, to say to them, We'll be proud of you if you come and tell us right. that you saw this. It takes a lot of this. humility and courage. Yeah. And, and don't be ashamed. Mm. I mean, that to me is like the two-edged sword because you know the devil tempts us by taking away our sense of shame. And then once we've sinned, Heaps he accuses on. us by right. giving it back a hundredfold so that we feel so ashamed and unforgivable. Mm. But I mean, the parents have to really lead the way you know, and I, and I just love that. Yeah. I mean, rhetorically, but also interpersonally, that goes right to the heart yeah. of the matter. Mm. You yeah. know what strikes me? Because I'm much older than any of you, and that's the great Rubicon we've crossed. When I was a boy about Scott's age, you could get porn, but you had to go to the wrong side of the tracks to find it in, in, you know, in brown paper bags. It was furtive, it was shameful, and it was expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a matter of course, most kids my age never saw porn. But now you can't escape it. It's everywhere. I mean, that adjective, pornified, mm -hmm. uh, really is, I think, les mots justes. It is accurate. That's exactly the kind of culture we've, we've created. And we are complicit mm -hmm. if we don't speak up. Absolutely. Well, when we come back, uh, we're going to have some final thoughts on this topic, so please stay with us. Personally, I was introduced to porn when I was eight years old, and I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, it's just kind of all I grew up with until I came here to Franciscan University, and I met the men of Corpus Christi household, and they helped me grow in holiness, and slowly but surely learning the teachings of John Paul II of Theology of the Body, I've been able to grow even more as a man and grow even more holy so that I can spread this amazing news to the rest of the world. Your skills in the classroom have transformed young lives. Now become a leader among your peers and take your teaching career to new heights with a Master's in Education or Educational Administration from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Franciscan's program is tailored to your needs. Take classes online full-time or part-time. Find out more about Franciscan University's career-changing Master's in Education or Educational Administration at franciscan.edu slash msed. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy 
and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily Mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, could you start us off yeah, with your thoughts? Uh, yeah, Matt, thank you so much. This has been a, a powerful uh, witness, and I'm, I'm so grateful, and I hope uh, our audience uh, is equally moved by, by your eloquence uh, and uh, the cogency of the arguments that you're making. A lot of it turns on freedom, which is widely misused, uh, uh, abused, perverted. But what is freedom? It's the capacity we have to achieve self-fulfillment, to maximize mm. the possibilities of my personhood, to adhere to what it means to be human, to pursue the good, the true, the beautiful, to find God, you know, without impediment, with encouragement. And for that to happen, we need grace. I mean, that's the therapy of the soul. Without grace, we are demonic nothingness. It's that serious, and you just can't buy grace. It's a gift. It's got to be given, and God is anxious, eager to give us heaps and heaps of grace, and it comes out of human need, this desperate desire to fulfill the self. Everything else uh, doesn't work. I mean, the freedom that pornography promises brings enslavement. Uh, the excitement that it promises just brings ennui, frustration, boredom, uh, and the intimacy, you know, the intimacy that I really want, I don't get it from porn. What I get is isolation, the, you know, the self-centered self. There's no fun in that. So things have gotten a lot worse, but I'm hopeful because you represent an oasis, uh, and I'm just, I'm just praying that more and more people can, uh, can hear your message. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. As terrifying as... Uh uh, 1984 was Brave New World was also terrifying and it yeah. made the point I think that uh, when you become addicted to pleasure you become stupid I think Thomas right. Aquinas said right. something that's yeah. something similar yeah. and I think uh, we're just sort of like well all sin is idiots. a deliberate stupidity yeah. Yeah. you're doing it on purpose that's a good definition yeah. 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 yeah Scott what are your thoughts well I want to thank you again for the practical advice that we find near the end of the book about how to love our kids because parents love their kids but they don't know how they don't know how to express that love, especially when it comes to parenting in a way that they didn't need to be parented or with the internet, that, that kind of thing. I'm also appreciative of the fact that you are setting up readers, whether they're believers or unbelievers, to recognize the importance of what it means for us to be sexual creatures of God. That there is a teleology, there is a goal. The purpose of this is children, you know, and the purpose of raising children in a family is to enjoy your spouse. You know, Sigmund Freud, who was no friend of Christianity nor even a believer in God, you know, at the end of his career as a founding father of psychology and paranormal uh, psychology, he, he, abnormal psychology, he, he indicates the one thing that all deviant behavior has in common when it comes to sexuality is that they're closed to childbirth. And, 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 and the, you talk about how people are get, they, they end up shriveled by their addiction to pornography. On the other hand, mm -hmm. nothing pulls us out of ourselves like having children and then raising them together. You know, we're in our 40th year of marriage and I never knew that we could have this deep of a friendship, have so much fun, and have a kind of intimacy that goes beyond adolescence, but at the same time, it's physical. It's not just two angels, you know, mm. embracing. And I, and, I, and I think that we want to exemplify that to our kids, not because we're impervious to temptation, you know, that sort of thing, but because this is what sexuality is for, marriage, family, fulfillment. I mean, I have frustrated my wife more than any other person on the planet, and she has frustrated me not nearly as much as I have her. But I mean, the fulfillment and the friendship, this is the reverse side of what porn addiction does and yeah. what pornography is all about. And I, I think you're living that, you're communicating it. So the bad news sets you up for the good news, but the good news is better than we can imagine. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Amen. Matt, some final thoughts? Well, final thoughts, I guess I would say some things can only be healed by the antiseptic light of truth. And we're seeing wow. in society and in the church now what happens when you cover the gross stuff. Mm. It just sort of festers and comes out eventually. So I think it's really important if people are engaging in this sort of stuff that they do bring this up to somebody. Uh, I think 
if I could boil it down, if you say, well, what's the main reason people go to pornography? I think I would say it's that they want to soothe themselves. There's mm. this emotional turbulence. It's the same reason I want to drink whiskey, eat peanut butter M&Ms and binge on Netflix at the end of the night. You know, it's like we're, we're just done and we want to soothe, you know, and unfortunately from a young age, young people have learned to soothe on, on this sort of evil material. Um, and so it's learning how to cope with that emo emotional turbulence, how to become a adult, uh, a well-formed human person. Um, but that, that has to begin with bringing this out of the dark and into the light in a positive way. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you, man. Yeah. Well, if you are interested in uh, learning more about today's topic, we have a free handout for you. This was an article about pornography written by Matt Frad, originally published in the Huffington Post. Uh, and this is yours for free by simply going online to faithandreason.com or by calling the number you'll see on the screen in just a moment. You know, my final thoughts on this topic is uh, the book is so impressive in terms of its secular arguments regarding pornography, but for me it is that that opens the door to the sacred. And uh, there is a way that the secular arguments can make it you know, sound like a bad idea and something we mm -hmm. shouldn't do, but the sacred adds the holiness of yes. the sexual act. You know, that what this is and, and what people are looking at, you know, I, I came to this realization at one point in my own life and it really helped me to uh, avoid pornography is when I realized that if marriage is a sacrament, you're watching the, de the desecration of a sacrament. I wouldn't watch yeah. a video of somebody desecrating wow. the Eucharist. Uh, and that's exactly what's going on in pornography and that's exactly what's happening in our society. And yet there is freedom, uh, there is grace, and there is glory that God can restore this. I think of uh, C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, that beautiful image of you know, the demon that was on the shoulder, oh, yeah. you know, don't kill me, don't kill me. Yeah. And once, once it was killed, it became the stallion mm. that this man rode off on. And, yeah. and I think you're really exposing the little lizard on the shoulder. Yeah. And uh, that book can be part of a stab to it when we realize the lie of pornography and the freedom of God both together uh, is a powerful combination that I believe really uh, can transform society and can save our children if we're diligent and prayerful about it. So Matthew, thank you so much for the work that Thanks you're doing me. in the book and everything else yeah. That, yeah. that you're doing in ministry. And I want to invite you to be a part of Franciscan University of Steubenville and join us in our mission to educate, evangelize, and to send forth disciples to restore all things in Christ. Maybe you can enroll in one of our education programs or get your degree here on campus from one of our online programs. Another way to connect with Franciscan University is through our life-changing summer conferences for adults and for youth that are offered in 13 locations in the United States or, and Canada, by the way, or travel uh, with us on one of our pilgrimages to holy shrines in Italy, Poland, the Holy Land, other sacred destinations around the world. Just want to encourage all our listeners once again, go to faithandreason.com for today's handout or to watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, as well as watch hundreds of talks that will inspire and inform your faith. So why don't we close in a prayer? Mm -hmm. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of our sexuality. We thank you for the gift of grace and the gift of freedom. We ask that you would show us our dignity, and the dignity of the human person, the dignity of the human body. And I pray for all those who are enslaved, that they would be set free, uh, and that you would reign as king forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.